All right, so good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those who don't know, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. This week is especially exciting for us because we are celebrating World Oceans Day. So we're building up, uh, we're doing over 50 hangouts with ocean explorers, researchers, scientists from around the world uh, all week long, building up to Friday. And so thank you so much for joining us for our, our big spectacular. Right now, we've got five classes joining us from across North America, some with technical difficulties, so I'll give them a chance to do a bit of a shout out. So we've got Mr. Rotman's grade twos in San Antonio, Texas. Everyone wave. Hey guys. Hi. Hi. We've got Miss Rennick's grade sixes in Pennington, New Jersey. <laughs> with the mood lighting, I like it. We've got Mr. Chris's grade oh. uh, in Canton, Michigan. <laughs> guys. And then with technical difficulties, sometimes they can hear us. We've got Miss Tang's grade sevens in Kingston, Ontario. <laughs> they can hear us now. Okay, very excited. That's like the most excited grade seven class I think we've ever had. Uh, and then we have Miss Cooper's grade seven eights that can some I don't know if they can hear us, but they're there. They're in Ontario. Yes, they can hear us. Oh, perfect. Okay, cool. Of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our, there we go, the audio is working, uh, is for our speaker. We're joined live uh, by Michelle Cho, who's at the Anderson Cabot Center at the New England Aquarium, and she works in blending science with actual fisheries to produce sustainable solutions, come up with really neat ways that we can help the ocean environment. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Michelle, and take it away. Hi guys, thanks so much for joining us. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I've never done anything like this, so, and I'm really excited that it's World Oceans Week. So I'm gonna share my presentation with you right now. Um, okay. So again, my name is Michelle Cho, and I'm here at the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life at the New England Aquarium. So this is what the aquarium looks like. I don't know if any of you have been here, but we are in Boston, in Massachusetts, right on the Boston Harbor, which is where some rebels dumped tea into the harbor to start the Revolutionary War um, back in the 1700s. Obviously, we're an aquarium, so we have animals here. We have penguins and turtles and fish and um, all sorts of invertebrates and other kinds of animals. And we have over a million visitors a year. So they come to see the animals that we have on exhibit but a lot of them don't know that we also have a lot of research and conservation and education programs going on behind the scenes. So about two years ago, we established the Center for Ocean Life here, and um, I could talk about it, but I'm just going to show you a you short video that is this event. better at explaining Consequence that. for talking. <laughs> My first in to sort of inspire my interest in marine science was snorkeling with my dad. We saw a small cuttlefish swim in front of us and it inked right there and I thought that, that was the coolest thing ever. The first time I put a mask on my face as a kid and I realized you could actually see things underwater, I was just blown away. When I was little, I saw a lot of documentaries by Jack Stone, and I remember thinking that whales were so big and yet so vulnerable to humans. I wanted to do something about it. The New England Aquarium inspired me because I came here as a young child, and I was walking into an underwater garden. I've always had a passion for nature and animals. The oceans are under threat. We are about transforming our science into impact. As humans, I feel like it's our responsibility to safeguard the health of our natural resources and our planet. The Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life is a really unique place to make change in our oceans. I've done a lot of work on the North Atlantic right whale, and this has been a strong collaboration within the center here, both with the right whale team that does a lot of photo identification and has been working with the right whale for nearly 40 years. Working with the industry and with the state regulators and the federal regulators on wind energy areas to try to determine 
if in fact the installation of those things will have any effect on the marine environment. We are a fairly neutral party with strong scientific chops and that makes a difference. Doing the fundamental science to understand the problems because if you don't understand the problems, you can't solve the problems. Especially with climate change, that's a big part of, of our research. We know the temperature is going to continue to rise for the foreseeable future. So it's, it's a matter of trying to figure out which species are going to be most impacted by those changes. And that's the kind of work that the center allows us to do. You have to have a scientific home and someplace that allows you to keep going beyond just a one or two year grant and do more long term studies. Using our, our front yard here in the Gulf of Maine, which is the body of water that's warming faster than any other in the world is a living lab. It's a really powerful model in that we can solve locally and scale so those impacts are global. We funded 140 projects in more than 40 countries around the world across six continents. The program is having an impact on conservation leaders around the world and their ability to be positive agents of change for the ocean. Working with industry and environmental groups, all the stakeholders, is in our DNA. That's the only way you get long-term success in conservation efforts. We really are at the precipice of change to be able to move the science that's been happening here to solve problems into the future. One of the things I'm most excited about with the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life is that we're going to lead with science and the facts will take us to the right place. Both Ed and I love the ocean I find it not only beautiful, but spiritually uplifting, and it means really the world to both of us. My goal is to inspire our team to do great work, but also inspire others to join us in this search to try to protect the oceans. Okay, so, um, back to the slideshow. So that's what we're doing. Um, here at the Anderson Cabot Center. And then I also wanted to talk a little bit about how I got here. It's sort of like this picture, which um, is kind of funny. And I got this idea from a coworker of mine, so I can't take credit for it. But I thought it was especially fitting for someone like me because um, I didn't always know what I wanted to do when I grew up. And of course, I always loved the water. But my dad was one of those people that was like, oh, I knew I wanted to be a doctor from when I was four years old. And then he became a doctor. But I always thought, oh, you know, maybe one day I would want to be a children's book writer and illustrator, and another day I would want to be a professional athlete. And then um, when I was in sixth grade, which back then was the last year of elementary school, our teachers took us on a graduation trip to an aquarium that was several hours bus ride away. And I remember going in and seeing sharks and beluga whales and fish and all the other critters being wowed and, and going home and thinking, I want to be a marine biologist, but then I'm sure that changed the next week. Um, so when I finally got to college, I majored in East Asian studies, which has nothing to do with oceans, except for some of those countries are surrounded by oceans. Um, so then I think what happened was that after that, I lived in Asia and I worked and I traveled for three years. And then the first time I went to Thailand, I learned how to scuba dive and I was reminded of, of this amazing world. Um, and I also had a lot of um, experience diving all over Southeast Asia. And I would see that there were people were dynamite fishing just because they were desperate and that's just using dynamite to, to cause an explosion in the sea and all the fish would come up dead and then they could bring them up um, and sell them but this was ruining all the other stuff around it. So at that time I thought, I really wanna do something about this. Um, so when I came back to the States, I had to spend a lot of time doing my undergraduate um, no, requirement science classes because I hadn't done that um, yet. And then I went to grad school. And then after that, um, I got a job with the state of Connecticut and I worked on their uh, research boat. So we were fishing in Long Island Sound, which is the water between Connecticut and Long Island, New York. Um, and then counting everything we caught and figuring out what it was and then measuring it and weighing it so we could get an idea of what, what was living in there, how many there were, um, how old they were, how big they were, and then how that was changing over time. 
And then I went and I did that for the federal government on commercial fishing boats. So these are the guys that are fishing to catch large amounts to sell um, in stores and restaurants to people like us. And so we were really just looking at the catch and figuring out what they were catching, um, also measuring and weighing it to get an idea again of what was in there and how that was changing over time. Um, so then I came here to the aquarium and um, I really worked on the projects that we had that was trying to improve fishing practices. So making them less harmful to the environment and also recognizing the things that were done well. So when you're talking about um, fishing for seafood that we buy in the grocery store and in the um, in the restaurants, we're not talking about people that are going out with just a fishing rod and catching a few fish like you and I would do. Um, these are really big boats and they're trying to catch a lot um, in a small amount of time. So we're looking at what kinds of impacts that have um, what is happening to the ocean in addition to them catching the fish and um, making recommendations to companies that buy and sell seafood, so for groceries and restaurants, and also the companies that supply that seafood to those groceries and, and restaurants. Um, so the main thing that we're looking at really is the, what kind of gear is being used. So when you're trying to catch a lot of fish, in a small amount of time, you're using big nets or long lines with lots of hooks or a lot of traps that are strung together. So this picture is of a bottom trawl net. Um, and you can see on either side, there's a heavy door to keep the net open and also weigh it down. And then the whole thing is dragged across the bottom. So that could, you know, it could harm the stuff on the bottom, which can be things like corals or homes for lots of fish and other animals, also hiding places for little babies that are too small to fend for themselves. Um, and then also you can see this net is, is gonna catch everything in its way, not just the things that they are trying to catch. So the other things that we look at, um, again, like I was doing on the for the state of Connecticut, looking at the different fish that are living there, what how that's changing over time, and then also, what the rules are in place for the people that are that are going out and fishing for them. So not just anyone can buy a big boat with a big net and go out and fish and then sell to stores. Um, they have to have permits and follow all these rules and laws. Um, and those are set up by the federal government or the state government, and sometimes international treaties based on where they're fishing. Um, so we just look at how appropriate those are. Are they helping? Um, population levels stay at a healthy rate or are they um, helping them rebuild? And then we also look at um, aquaculture, which is just a, the word for fish farming. So looking at what you would want to know about um, farming any other kind of meat like chicken or cows or um, pigs, those animals are being fenced in in small areas and you know they could get sick, they could escape, um, there could be other animals coming to try to eat them. So, and then they're fed um, food. And for aquaculture, it's often fish that are, that are wild fish. So they're fishing for the fish to feed the farmed fish. Um, so we're looking at all that stuff and then we come up with recommendations on what we think these companies should do and where they should buy their seafood. Um, so another way that we are looking to improve um, the act of fishing or recognize things that are done well is, is focusing strictly on, on the bycatch part of it. So the stuff that is caught that they're not meaning to catch. And that could be anything from fish or um, turtles, dolphins, whales, birds, and things like corals too. Um, so we're trying to reduce the amount of bycatch or think of ways that that it can be avoided. Um, and some ways to do that is to change the gear so that, sorry, this is another picture of bycatch. Change the gear so that um, animals can escape from this. So this is a picture of a turtle excluder device. So they were finding that a lot of turtles were following shrimp into nets and then getting stuck and sometimes killed. Um, so they put this, you can see it, it's a little gray inside the net, looks like a grill. So the shrimp can pass easily through into the net, but the turtle will hit that, and then there's a little escape panel, like it's shown here. Um, another picture of that. 
And this kind of concept is used for all kinds of animals, also for sea lions and fish as well. Um, and some of the work that we're doing here, you saw in the video all that footage of whales. This is the North Atlantic right whale, um, and it's an endangered species. There's less than 440 left in the world, and they're only found here in the North Atlantic. Um, so we have a lot of experience studying these animals, um, 40 years studying this population in particular. And um, so we, we know so much about them, and we know that one of the biggest threats to them is um, when they get caught in fishing gear, entangled in the in the ropes that are used to fish. So this is a picture of a whale. And you know, whales don't have, it's funny to think about it, but whales don't have fingers, or they, if they get tangled up in something, they can't just untangle themselves. It's really hard for them to do that. And so this can be dangerous for them. They can be dragging a lot of gear. You can see how much rope is on this, and then that could be attached to traps that are heavy and dragging it down. And whales need to breathe air, so sometimes they they can drown them or they can um, really stress them out. They can affect their ability to eat. And if they can't eat, then they lose a lot of weight and eventually die. Or they can entangle a small whale that then grows into this rope entangling them that can cut into their skin and leave them open to get sick or um, infections. So knowing what we know about these whales and how they get entangled, we. We know that, so at number one, this is a whale getting entangled. It swam into this rope that's connected to a buoy at the top, and it, it might just keep getting more and more entangled. Um, so removing some of that rope from the water that is used for fishing is, is one of our goals. And this is, the concept is called ropeless fishing, um, even though there's still rope involved, as you can see. So in number two, there's a spool that sits on the bottom that's attached to all these lobster traps. Um, that you can see are those gray sort of cages at the bottom. Um, and then the boat knows where the spool is because it has the GPS coordinates and um, and it can send down a signal that then releases the spool that goes up to the surface, unravels all that rope to get up there, and then the boat can just haul it on um, and it's not endangering these animals that are, are swimming through the water at the time. So this is obviously a really high-tech solution, probably really expensive, and but we're testing this right now in these waters to see um, if it's gonna affect the amount of fish that are caught and if it can actually really decrease the number of whales that are that are tangled up in this gear. Um, this is another picture of how it works. And then we're also looking at whale release rope, which is really just, um, Using the idea that rope has gotten stronger over time, it used to be made out of natural fibers, so it would break um, or would disintegrate over time. But as the years have gone on, rope has gotten stronger and stronger, and they use things like polypropylene, which is um, like a kind of plastic, and that never break, or it takes a very long time for them to break, and they don't disintegrate over time in the water. So um, if we go back to these weaker ropes or whale release rope, the idea is that they'll break and it won't cause as much stress to the whale to be dragging so much gear. Um, so some ways we could do that is we could use this weaker rope for all the fishing gear or we could put in little intervals. So this orange part of this rope has been spliced into the rest of the rope and they'll put that at regular intervals so that if an animal is entangled, it can break, break free at these sort of weak areas. It's just another picture of that. Um, and then here's a picture of the gear being hauled up. So this is um, one of the lobster boats that is testing this um, whale release rope or weaker links that we've added to the rope. And they've, um, they've been doing that here in Massachusetts to see if this is something that we can switch out a lot of the gear with and will be less risky for the right whales. Um, and then another way that we're trying to, you know, once we test all these solutions and we have some ideas that we think can work all over the world, we, we want to share that information with, with other people fishing that might have that, the same issues. Um, so we have a website where we put all the scientific studies up um, and help people find solutions that they can test and then connect them with um, researchers around the world that have been looking at things like this. 
Um, so this is just, this is called the Global Bycatch Exchange. And then we're also, we also want to take that information that we found um, and figure out ways that they can be used all over the world. So we work with, um, the United Nations actually has a food and agricultural organization. So we are hoping to write some international guidelines that then all the member countries could take up and use if they have um, specific problems with marine mammal bycatch. There's also some sea turtle guidelines and, and seabird guidelines for people that are going out and fishing and um, for large amounts of fish so that they can reduce their bycatch and risk to those animals. So that is um, all I had to talk to you guys about today. And um, and I'd love to hear any questions that you guys have. Great. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was wonderful. Uh, all right, so we've got our classes. Let's start with Mr. Rotman's class. If you guys have a question, come on up. If your mic wants to behave. All right, can Why you hear us? There we go. Yep, you're good to go. Okay, let me see if anyone has a question. Um, let's see. We'll get Cristiano come up here, please. All right, make some room for him. Let me angle it up. All right, come on. Okay, you want to talk to them? Go ahead. What kind of fish do you get? Like, what kind of fish are y'all uh, catching primarily with the ropes and everything? The, the picture that I showed you of the ropes that are catch it, that are entangling the whales, um, those are lobster traps. But it's really any kind of gear that you're using that has a line to a buoy at the surface. <laughs> so it could be a net on the bottom or a line with lots of hooks. Um, and because the, those whales, if you're asking about those whales in particular, are found only here, we do have a lot of seafood here, things like lobster, crabs, um, cod and haddock and flounders, things like that that are found right in New England. Do you, do you fish? Do you fish, Cristiano? Do you guys? Yes. Do you fish? Yes. We, had, we were talking about the Gulf of, of Mexico the other day yeah. in Texas, but just in general, it's a good, I think that the, the gist is that you know, whatever you're fishing for, that sort of gear can get entangled with whales. It can all present problems, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, and he says he, had, he does fish, so. Okay. We'll go to Miss Rennick's class for now. Question. You guys have a question? Come on up. Allie, do you have a question? Anybody have a question? Anybody? Okay. Well, I have a question. Um, what are you doing? We can come back in a minute. Yeah. Well, one of the questions that I heard earlier from the kids is, how did you, once you got into college, what was the steps that you took in order to figure out this was exactly what you wanted to do? What did you have to go through to make this happen? So that's, that's actually a really good question. And I could have talked a little bit more about that, but it's funny because I, um, I got to college and I went to a small liberal arts school and they suggest that you take a lot of subjects, a little bit of a lot of subjects before you focus in on what you want to do, which is kind of what you guys are doing now. So they want you to take a little science, a little math, a little um, English literature, a little history or social studies and foreign language as well. Um, but when I got close to graduating, I realized that I hadn't taken the science classes that I needed to. So I just needed to write a letter and say, explain why I hadn't done that because I was busy taking other classes. But um, so when I came back from Asia, after learning how to scuba dive, I had to spend a lot of time taking those classes. And I think, you know, there's a lot of things that are going to happen to you along the way. It isn't like a straight line, um, but it just goes to show that you don't have to know what you want early on. It's never too late to figure out how to get to where you want. That Some of the things that I took are, I think there are probably a lot of right decisions I could have made as far as what I wanted to study or what I wanted to do. I had a lot of different interests, but it was sort of um, what I felt like I would be happiest with and what would keep interesting me. And um, even on vacation, like I always wanted to go scuba diving or go to the ocean. So I figured if I was working on something like that, then, then it would make me pretty happy with my work, which I think it has. One of our biggest themes that everyone seems to feel that their job isn't really much of a job as they're doing the thing that they love so much. So, that's excellent. All right, let's go to Mr. Chris's class. Yeah, 
Ishikarp is an invasive species in the Great Lakes. Have you seen this in other parts of the world? What can we be done about this? Yeah, that's a great question. That is um, happening in other parts of the world. Like there's Nile perch in Lake Victoria in Africa. Um, there's also tilapia, which we farm everywhere around the world and has become established everywhere, is originally from um, the Middle East and, and Northern Africa, African areas. Um, but it can be a problem, like you were saying, in the Great Lakes because these fish, and also happening in Lake Victoria as well, they're, they're eating all the other fish and changing the balance of the, the animals that are in there so much that it's really affecting the entire ecosystem and you know a lot of those little fish are going extinct um, so one way I think that rule makers have tried to help that is by letting people fish for them as much as they can so trying to remove as much as they can um, also trying to make sure that this stuff isn't happening in the first place so I think they were finding that through boats a lot of boats were bringing on bringing in different um, animals that were then in places that they weren't living in originally and then they were getting established there. So I think if we can be careful about not, not bringing different animals and even plants um, to places where they're not usually formed because you never know what the effects will be or what the consequences are. So. Excellent. And we'll go to Ms. Cooper's class with the class. Okay, <laughs> Oh, um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, somebody, somebody wanted to know what the salary of a marine biologist was. That's a great question. It actually really varies on what you do. Um, obviously, we're not making what somebody on Wall Street is making. Uh, but I think there's so many other things that we get out of it. If you have an advanced degree, I think that helps a lot. Like if you have a, a PhD um that helps a lot but there there's a wide range and there's also a lot of entry level positions and then um you know professors in college colleges that make a lot of money so there's a, a big range all right let's go to back to mr robbins class you guys have a second question Might have to demute your own mic again. Sorry, guys. It's doing weird things for me. All right. Can you hear us now? Yep, we're good. All right. We got one coming up here. Let me move the iPad holder. All right. What's your question? Have y'all caught any fish that that y'all haven't caught before? Like any discoveries that you've made? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So we have some other programs here at the center. Um, one of them was in the in the Central Pacific, so that we established this uh, marine protected area in this in the middle of the Pacific Ocean that was about the size of California. So it was really big and they did a lot of um, deep sea diving there and they found um, not fish, but they found an invertebrate. So um, it's called a nudibranch and it's, um, it's like this, this animal that is, doesn't have any bones. So it's just kind of floats in the water and they found a few other things, maybe a shrimp too. So that was really cool. They're always finding new animals in the ocean, which is one of the reasons I think it's really cool. One of the things, again, we get a lot and a lot of hangouts, whether it's rainforest researchers or ocean researchers, uh, anytime you go out, you will find new species, which is very cool. Yeah. Excellent. Let's go to uh, back to Ms. Rennick's class. Okay, so you discussed how... um. There is one endangered species close to us in the North Atlantic that you're trying to prevent the um, capturing of. Are there any other ones that you are currently working on to try and help? Yeah, uh, well, we've done a lot of work with the harbor porpoise, which is also found in the North Atlantic, but also all over the world. They were getting caught in nets, and they're like a small porpoise species. So think of like a really small dolphin that doesn't have a, a nose. And so they were getting caught in these nets. Um, so they put this, if you remember, like dolphins can echolocate, so they're using sonar to figure out where they're going. So they put um, a pinger that's sending out this acoustic signal so that the, the harbor porpoises can, can 
detect that and then try to avoid those areas. Um, and that actually has worked really well. Those, some of that original research was done here a few decades ago. Um, and it doesn't affect the fish because they're not, they're not um, reacting in the same ways as the, those mammals are. Excellent. And you mentioned too, I mean, with the, the global bycatch uh, registry, you know, the research that you guys are doing off the East Coast of the U.S. can be applied anywhere and the solutions that you guys have come up with can help any animals that are in trouble. That's right. Yeah. And we're also, because we have so much expertise here, we're sent to places like Mexico where there's a vaquita, another um, mammal species that, that is in danger of becoming extinct. I think there's less than 30 of them now. Um, and then also the same thing is happening with pots, crab pots in the Pacific and endangered humpback whales there. So we can try to help and, you know, share the lessons that we've learned here with those um, people over there. Excellent. All right. Well, we'll do our last couple of questions. We'll go back to Ms. Cooper's class first. Uh, Caleb, send that. Yeah. You guys ever catch any sharks? Yeah, we have a lot of sharks. <laughs> Um, I think that well, there might be somebody else that's talking about that, but we have a lot of shark work going on, um, not that I'm involved in, but on the bycatch side of it, actually, sharks are often caught on hooks, and so using um, this sort of decoy that sends out this electric signal that they will then either be attracted to that instead of the hook or um, avoid the hook, and also sometimes magnets and, and things like that. and. Um, we do have a shark scientist here, two shark scientists at the center that are working on other things like that. One of them puts um, that like the thing that is in a Fitbit, they tag a shark with it so they can figure out uh, where it's moving and and how often it's moving and figure out um, lots of all things like that. You could probably find out more on our website about their work. Yeah. Or I can and get them to do a hangout with us. We'll just we'll yeah. get all of your staff slowly but surely. Yeah. Uh, okay, before the last question, I just got to say the fact that there was like this giant guy hiding behind the front row of girls that jumped up there was amazing. That like makes everyone's day. So thank you for that. Uh, all right, let's go back to Mr. Chris's class uh, for our last question, guys. Go ahead. Is there a species close that's close to an extinction because of overfishing, like tuna or salmon? Yeah, that, that happens a lot. Um, they, salmon is different. Well, there's a lot of different salmon runs than they go back to their original um, birthplace to spawn. So sometimes some of those are healthy and some of them aren't. But um, things like fish that live for a really long time and they're not a lot of them, but they're really tasty because they live for a really long time. So they have um, a lot of oil in them. like like Chilean sea bass or something like that. Those are, are the ones that um, that are faced with things like being threatened from overfishing. Also cod here in the, in the North Atlantic here, not all over the North Atlantic, but off of New England. Um, there's been a lot, of, a lot of cod for, and it's not just overfishing. I think there's a lot of other things that are happening, but that is definitely one of the factors that um, goes into these, species becoming, their populations being at low levels or near threatened and near extinction. Before we wrap up then, so one of the things that I'd always love to ask the researchers is what can the kids in the classes do to help make sure that we don't overfish, to make sure that we don't wipe out species? Like what, what can we do? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, if you guys have a favorite fish that you eat, just ask questions on where it came from, what kind of fishing gear was used to catch it, um, because I think if people that are selling fish know that you are interested in this, um, that will make them realize that there's a lot of interest in this. And, um, and then try to, try to try new things. So I think a lot of us here, especially in the U.S., like to always eat tuna or salmon or shrimp. But if we sort of um, relieve a little bit of that pressure and try new things, I think that can help as well. I know, so in Canada, we have a program called OceanWise, where if you go to restaurants, OceanWise tells you if the fish was fished sustainably. Is there anything that jumps to mind for the classes in the States? Um, 
we don't have something here, but OceanWise also works with Monterey Bay Aquarium that okay. has a seafood rating system that's red, yellow, and blue. So it's pretty easy to follow. Perfect. So that's a great thing that if you guys are just going to restaurants, you can check out or in grocery stores too. All right. And so Michelle, at the end of every hangout, what we do is I'm going to deem you every class's microphone. And Mr. Chris, Ms. Rennick, Ms. Cooper, Ms. Robin, if you guys could join me in saying a big thank you to Michelle. Michelle, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'd love to have you back anytime. And, and bring your colleagues. We'll get some sharks and whales and fisheries research. We'll, we'll cover the whole gamut. Yep. All right. And